get those kegs ready because on this episode of Doing the Most, we're collaborating with Homebrew Ohio to make some crushable fruited hydromels. Homemade brews and various artists, everything from meat to roast. Big creation, fermentation, and ebriation, doing the most. On a previous episode of Doing the Most, we created a crispy honey hydromel that is perfect for kegging. And what better way to expand on a delicious hydromel recipe than to add fruit? In talking to the good folks over at Homebrew Ohio, we decided to see what would happen if we tried to convert the recipe to incorporate some berry purees. And I do want to give a big shout out to Courtney and the rest of the team at homebrewohio.com. They were such a joy to work with on this collaboration. And I can say this from the heart that I can honestly recommend ordering from them. As far as I can tell, my first order with Homebrew Ohio was back in 2017 and I still order from them. Their prices on bottles really can't be beat. And on a recent order from them due to the pandemic, the yeast I wanted wasn't yet available. And they were so great. They emailed me and coordinated with me and I decided to wait and eventually the yeast became available and they kept me looped in throughout the whole process. And so I highly recommend Homebrew Ohio, and not just because we collaborated on this video, but because as a customer, they've been great to me also. And I wanna give a shout out to their YouTube channel. They're putting out some really cool content and I think everyone should head over there and hit that subscribe button on Homebrew Ohio's YouTube. I'll put the link in the description of this video. So one morning during mail call, a large package arrived for me and contained within were two purees. Homebrew Ohio and I worked through their warehouse to try and figure out what the best purees for this project might be. So we decided on two very different kinds of berry, boysenberry and blackberry. The can of boysenberry puree was just over three pounds and the blackberry puree was almost four and a half pounds. A couple things to note when you are brewing with prepackaged purees. They do contain fruit pulp and thus you should be using pectic enzyme to help break that fruit pulp down. And also you don't want to heat them. Heating these up, even if you're boiling them in work, can cause some off flavors. So you really want to put them in at room temperature. And for these brews, I'm going to use QA23 yeast because that's what I had on hand. Now we're converting the hydromel recipe, the crispy hydromel recipe from our previous video. So in developing this recipe, we're using a lot of the same ingredients and practices that we used in that video, including starting out with three grams of red wine tannin for each of these base hydromels. Just using my hanging scale here to weigh my buckets so I can do a little bit of math, we are going to put five pounds of honey into each of these brew buckets. And I am using wildflower honey here rather than the orange blossom honey we used in the other video because I wanted to experiment with a more neutral flavored honey. Now I'll note here that typically we start out with an ingredients card at the beginning of these episodes. Our ingredients cards are going to fall at the end because I want to talk about what we learned and how I would brew these if I was brewing them a second time and you know really how I recommend you should brew them if you're going to make your own batch at home. With our honey in then goes in our tannin and like I said I'm using red wine tannin here. I have been using so much red wine tannin as I've been doing experiments on balance in meads. Recently I bought a pound of red wine tannin so I would have plenty on hand. And now we're stirring really, really well to make sure that the honey is incorporated. And then I am using Fermade O as a yeast nutrient. So each of these buckets is going to get six grams of Fermade O as a yeast nutrient, and it's all going in on the front end. That way they have a nice smooth fermentation as they ferment down completely dry. And it won't take very long, about a week in primary. Grabbing myself a hydrometer reading on both of these, they clocked in at 1.042 each, which is exactly what I was going for for my target starting gravity. Yeast goes right in and tops go on. And I'm fermenting these open, which means I'm going to be putting a paper towel and an upturned coffee mug on top of these. That's just to let them breathe a little bit. I'm not super worried about my fermentations at the beginning once that yeast has kicked off of having any sort of chance of oxidation. And rather than risk a blow off, I like to let them breathe. If you saw our recent video reviewing the Easy Jiggler, you might recognize my turkey baster, which I will be using in this video to start my suction siphon. And as I mentioned in the previous video, I have not become adept at getting the siphon started with the bulb of the turkey baster. So a little suction 
and a little transferring to the carboy and we're off to the races. And you can see by the splatter here that I still make just a little bit of a mess as I get that siphon started. I am confident that I will perfect this technique. So as I'm racking these off, I'm actually transferring the hose back and forth because I am blending the two finished meads together. I wanna hit the pause button here and explain a little bit about what's going on. I was making a batch of Skeeter pea, which is a lemonade wine, and typically Skeeter pea is started with a yeast slurry from an already fermenting batch. So these hydromels actually got one more racking beyond what I would typically recommend for this recipe. However, I wanted to rack them off of their yeast slurries before I stabilized, so that way I could use the yeast from these hydromels to ferment 10 gallons of Skeeter pea. We are working on a new Skeeter pea video, but if you wanna check out our previous video on that, I'll throw it up in a card. So I'm just trying to get as much yeast out of here as possible. And now we're adding our stabilizers. And like I said, if I was doing this over again and I didn't want that yeast from the bottom of the batch, I would just go ahead and stabilize in the primary bucket. Adding potassium metabisulfide and potassium sorbate to these. These are stabilizing chemicals added to halt the yeast's synthesis as well as impair their ability to reproduce. Once these two ingredients have done their thing, then we will be able to back sweeten with fermentable sugar sugars, in this case, honey. So after about 48 hours, we're confident that those have been effectively stabilized and the yeast will no longer cause us any issues with re-fermentation. We're gonna open up our purees and rack on top of those. The boysenberry, using a can opener, was fairly simple to open. And then I just pinched the edge of that can and poured it into the carboy. I'll note that there was a lot of pulp in the bottom of this. It's probably best practice to shake it up before opening it, but I just sloshed it around and dumped it in. No problem. And then siphon on top of that. This will help mix it together and it will ensure that we don't overfill our carboy just in the event that the volume is more than what the carboy can handle. I could always pinch off that racking tubing. And then comes our blackberry puree. And what you're gonna do is just use the little pincher grip on the can opener. So what you're gonna do is get out some needle nose pliers and you'll just, and you just apply pressure to the outside of the, so what you're gonna do is sanitize a corner of that bag and just snip it off with some child safe scissors and create an opening there and pour it right in. And I will say, that I was very startled by <laughs> this pink color of the blackberry puree when it came out of here. I expected it to be as dark, if not darker than the boysenberry. And it was kind of a fluorescent pink, uh, which surprised me. And yes, you can see I'm still getting the hang of using that turkey baster. So look at all that pink in the bottom of there. That's all pulp and uh, we're gonna have to get that mixed up because what we want is for any of those flavor molecules to blend throughout the batch and then any solids to drop back out with the pulp. So this was my first attempt at checking the balance on both of these and I used my new turkey baster as a wine thief to pull my samples and what I'm checking for here is roundness, sweetness, and acidity and I'm just making some mental notes regarding those things, trying to figure out kind of where I wanna make my adjustments because there's so little fruit in here that we're gonna need to do just some minor enhancements in order to bring up the fruitiness of this batch. So I chose to go ahead and add just a little bit of malic acid that's two grams of malic acid going right into the boysenberry because there wasn't really any acidity to speak of at all. And so I felt fairly comfortable about making my first adjustment with a little bit of malic acid because it's a little bit of a round, soft-ish acid, not as soft as lactic acid. It's that same acid that's in apples. And so I wanted to give it a little bit of that acidity to kind of see where it fell before adding anything sharper. I'm also adding two teaspoons each of pectic enzyme to these to help break up some of that pulp matter that got added to it. All right, most of that pulp dropped out after another week. I pulled off a taste and now I'm starting to really kind of see where these things are going. And I was actually kind of surprised by how much boysenberry was really coming through already. However, 
both of these are fairly absent of any sweetness to kind of back up those fruity flavors. And honestly, part of the reason the purees were added in secondary after stabilization was to preserve some of those fruity flavors because fermentation can fundamentally alter the fruitiness of your fruit. So I made some notes and decided to do a back sweetening and some more adjustment, including adding additional acid to both the boysenberry and the blackberry, as well as varying amounts of honey to each to back sweeten them. So in total, the boysenberry got two grams of malic acid and one gram of citric, and the blackberry got one gram of malic acid. I decided to go with one pound of honey to back sweeten the boysenberry and only three quarters of a pound of honey to back sweeten the blackberry because the blackberry actually had quite a bit of sweetness in there. So we'll stir all that up and then add five crushed up Campton tablets to each of those. These help ward off any oxidation issues by bonding with free oxygen. And then we're gonna add some sparkaloid to help both of those clear up. The sparkaloid will help drop out any remaining fruit pulp, as well as remove any of the honey haze coming from that honey, which could be suspended proteins or pollens or any other things that might be in your honey. And a few days later, we are crystal clear. And I wanted to check again for balance as we were well on our way toward kegging this. So I tasted each and determined that both needed a little bit of tannin adjustment. So our final tannin amendment for the boysenberry ended up being five grams of tannin as well as five grams of tannin going into the blackberry. Neither of those purees really carried any tannin quality with them, which means that when they were made, they probably weren't exposed to a lot of stems and seeds, which is great because it gives us control over the tannin slash astringency slash roundness of the flavor profile because we can adjust it to our palates. So because I added tannin so late in the life of these, it'll kind of swirl around in there and fall to the bottom and leach its tannin out. And a little over a week later, we can be comfortable that it's kind of done its thing and dropped out of suspension. So with a Buddha beer in hand, it is time to get these suckers into kegs. So I put those in there, put them each under about 25 PSI for two days. And then I rolled each of the kegs for a half an hour before putting them on ice in the cooler. Yes, I don't have a kegerator set up yet, but I'm getting there. I had David come over to do a tasting, but because of barking dogs and sirens and general audio problems, I didn't really get good audio out of this, but I can convey both of our thoughts. Both of these taste delicious and crispy and crushable and fruity. I could actually see someone wanting to double the amount of fruit in here. And I'm kind of curious as to how fresh made fruit purees would play in here rather than canned. However, what I can tell you about these prepackaged purees is they do bring a lifelike fruitiness to these hydromels with a neutral enough tannin and acid profile that you can make your own adjustments by your palate to get that flavor balanced perfectly. Now, granted, that goes for the boysenberry and blackberry purees that we used here. I would presume that citrus fruit purees or other more highly acidic fruit purees may not carry as much neutrality as these berry purees did. But I was perfectly happy with them. They've got some really interesting stuff over there, and I have definitely uh, got some interesting ideas for how to make some more summertime hydromels out of those. When it comes to the blackberry, blackberry is David's favorite berry. And most of note to him was how the blackberry hydromel tasted more like an unripe blackberry or maybe like a black raspberry than it may taste like a, what you would traditionally expect from a blackberry. Now, that said, he liked it. It just didn't sing blackberry to him. His preference was the boysenberry. My preference was actually the blackberry. I thought it was just so well acid balanced and crispy and crushable. You would almost need to make tally marks so you didn't overindulge. The blackberry was seriously phenomenal and I'm definitely going to have to make a batch with some fresh homemade puree next time. So in making a recipe card for this, I took everything that I learned and condensed it into a form of how I would do this again. For the boysenberry hydromel, in primary, I would use five pounds of wildflower honey, 
water to five gallons, and five grams of wine tannin. Allow to ferment to completion, and then stabilize. 48 hours later, add one can of boysenberry puree, two grams of malic acid, one gram of citric acid, and one pound of honey. Clarify using your favorite fining agent, for me, that's Sparkaloid, and then once clear, transfer to a keg and carbonate. For the blackberry hydromel, in primary I would use five pounds of wildflower honey, water to five gallons, five grams of wine tannin, allow to ferment through to completion, and then stabilize. 48 hours after stabilization, I would add one bag of blackberry puree, one gram of malic acid, and three quarters of a pound of honey to back sweeten. Clarify with your favorite fining agent, and once clear, transfer to a keg and carbonate. Now say you don't own a kegging system and still want to make these. You could back sweeten with a sugar alcohol, like erythritol, and add priming sugar to carbonate your bottles. I would suggest about 3.5 ounces of dextrose as your priming sugar. And just keep in mind that sugar alcohols don't always carry the sweetness of like a one-to-one -one replacement. So you might actually, for example, for the blackberry hydromel, you might need a pound of erythritol instead of three quarters of a pound of honey to back sweeten. The best thing you can do is mix it with a little bit of hot water so it becomes like a syrup, pour that into your bottling bucket, stir gently, and then taste. That way you can sweeten it to your palate. Thank you as always for watching. I know this video was kind of a lot, but I hope it kind of shed some light on my process when I'm doing recipe development in terms of figuring out how to balance the flavors of ingredients so that they play best together. I think these fruited hydromel recipes are really fantastic. I'm sure there are ways to tweak and improve upon them, but if you're just looking for a great crushable summer sipper, these are pretty easy to put together and require very minimal ingredients for something that generates a five gallon keg worth of delicious mead. You can follow us on Instagram and Pinterest at doing the most okay, and our website is doing the most.org. Again, the link to Homebrew Ohio's YouTube channel will be in the description on this video. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time, keep doing the most.